And the epigraph goes, in order not to offend God, woman must give birth and love. Of chains and helmets. The divorce has lingered and lingered. For three years we were dividing the house, money, kids, cars, and cats. We've got to finish it today, I said to myself on the way to the meeting. Me, my soon-to-be ex-husband Ron, and our lawyers. I was six weeks pregnant, not by Ron. The lawyer's office was stuck in an alley in North Beach, behind the strip club Garden of Eden. I walked past the cheese store, looking at 1,000 cheeses in the window, wanting all of them, but unable to eat any of them. The blue cheese order made me nauseous. My morning sickness raged. For six weeks now, I was ravenously hungry, yet unable to hold any food down except for Korean marinated cabbage. Every time. When I was pregnant with my daughter, I could only eat pickles and pears. Only crab cakes with my son. Third time, candies only. Now, kimchi. <laughs> I looked around. Cafe Puccini, a liquor store, a sex shop, and a street club. No Korean restaurants. I got a cup of coffee to go in Cafe Puccini. The coffee was smooth, full, just like the velvety bay streaming from the dusty speaker. I sipped it, looked at the crumbling hazelnut, almond, and raspberry biscotti, wanting them all and not getting any of them, and kept walking. Walking was uncomfortable. Not because of my high heels. My heels were fine. When a woman confronts three men in tailored suits arriving to the meeting in red portions, the woman better wear heels. Heels are like guns. No, walking was not difficult because my pants, uh, because my heels were high. It was difficult because my pants were falling off. I always lost a lot of weight during the first trimester of pregnancy, only to balloon to the size of a bleem a few months later. <laughs> I should have worn a belt when I got dressed in the morning, and now I had a coffee in one hand and a bag with flies in the other hand, and I couldn't hold my pants up. A homeless man pointed at me, shouting, Hey you, hearty, I'm calling my lawyer, that's sexual harassment. I looked down. <laughs> My pants slid down, my underwear was showing. I hurried by in tiny steps like a Japanese geisha across the street towards the blinking light of the sex store, kittens and vixens. <laughs> Outside, it was a bright San Francisco day, but the store was dark. Lacy lingerie swung off hangers like lianas in jungles. Spikes on boots and black leather masks sparkled. I put my coffee cup on the glass case and looked underneath it. Handcuffs, vibrators, and dildos. <laughs> a whip. There was only one customer inside. A large, transvestite woman in heels even higher than mine, waiting by the counter. She smiled at me, her mouth dark red. A salesgirl in a fishnet dress came from the back of the store, a package in her hand. Do you have belts? I asked. For bondage? No, for pants. <laughs> no, not really, she said. It's, um, it's an emergency. I'm losing my pants. Both women looked at my hips. Girl, I wish I had your problem, said the transvestite woman. <laughs> no, no, it's because I'm newly pregnant. I just throw up a lot and congratulations, honey. Marge, I got your stockings here, said the sales girl. Just give me a minute. No worries, baby doll, said Marge. Help the girl out. I'll pick through the underwear here. The sales girl turned to me. How about a chain, she said. She pulled a thick, chunky chain from underneath the counter. I tried to adjust it to the pants, but it was heavy, slick, and slid off my hips with a clinking sound. We have nothing to lose but our chains 
said Marge, holding a see-through sun against her crotch. I used to be so into communists, my ex was chilling so hot. You read them, girls? Yeah, said the sales girl. Here. She held a neon pink shoelace in her hands. Here, she said. That will work? Five dollars. The neon shoelace shone bright in the dimness of the store and slid it in my hands like a snake as I started to pull it through the belt loops. Come on, Barbie, let's go party, said Margie. A life in plastic, it is fantastic. Let me help you, hon. She took the neon pink shoelace with her purple fingernails. Her hands were large even for a man, and her skin was dark brown. She tied it around me in a second. Marge is good at bondage, she said, winking at me. I wish you could tie my mind up, I said, giving the sales girl a five dollar bill. Do you want a receipt, she asked? Give it, said Marge. She took the receipt, pulled a lip pencil from behind her ear, and drew a big fat heart on the back of the receipt. It looked like a red fur ball. My eyes filled with tears. I didn't want to leave kittens and vixens. I did not want to step outside into the chilly daylight, into the noise of the street. I didn't want to go to the lawyer's office. I didn't want to go back to my life. Marge looked into my eyes and said, Oh, girl. She then hugged me to her chest, submerging me into her rich smell of sweat, cigarettes, and flowery perfume. It was warm, almost hot in her arms. For a moment, the nausea stopped, though. You hang in there, sis, said Marge. You know that song? What doesn't kill you makes you fight. Footsteps even lighter. <laughs> Look at you here, making a baby just as we talk. You show them, motherfuckers. <laughs> and she thrust her fist in the air. The office was brightly lit. Chinese red lacquer vases glistened on top of the filing cabinets. The conference room smelled of coffee and money. I sank into a black leather chair and crossed my legs. My ex-husband, Ron, soon to be, his blue motorcycle helmet under his arm walked in. He wore a suit under the jacket, the suit I helped him choose just before I left him. Nice helmet, said my lawyer, Greg. I have the same one at home. Me too, said Will, Ron's lawyer. I never liked helmets, said Ron, sitting down and pulling a file out of his bag. I know, said Greg. He also pulled a folder from his case. Remember the last day we were allowed to ride without helmets? I took my bike along Devil's Slides that day. All three of the men smiled and sighed a little. I bounced my heel up and down. I felt more nauseous than before. I also realized I left my bag with all the papers and kittens and vixens. All I had now was the receipt with a heart on the back. Shall we? asked Greg. All three men set laptops, cardboard folders, and notepads with pens in front of them, coughed, and started to talk. I twirled the receipt in my fingers. The men wrote numbers on the whiteboard. The highlighters squeaked, make, making me wince. They erased the numbers, wrote them again, scribbled those numbers on the notepads, typed them in Excel, spreadsheet boxes. Ron made a PowerPoint presentation. There were little square icons. The house, the cabin in Lake Tahoe, and the vacation house in Hawaii. A pie graph in bright violet and yellow stocks. Another graph had two lines, a fat black line like a roller coaster, Ron's income throughout the last 10 years. And a straight pink line parallel and very close to the horizontal axis, my income. I made almost no income in our 10 years of marriage. The pink line looked like the shoelace around my waist. But I was raising the kids, I said. I was pregnant. I breastfed. I was the breadwinner, said Ron. I drove them to school, doctor's appointments, activities. I paid for those activities. I worked too, I said, part-time. But 
Hold on, Zara, said Greg. We will have time to talk too. Go on, Ron. I felt the new feet of nausea and started to make an origami crane from the receipt. My son taught me how to. Ron was shown big numbers on his computer screen. Ron was good with numbers. I wasn't good with numbers, and I wasn't good at planning. I didn't plan this pregnancy. I just fell in love. Matthew was a writer and didn't own a thing. I already had three kids. I was tired of chicken soup, school pants, and math homework. I was scared of labor. Twenty hours of splitting pain, burning swords and sides, skin ripping apart. But I remember that my grandma had 18 abortions. They didn't have contraceptions at that time. And I remembered what Marge said. My body was making a baby. And then I remember the little stranger falling asleep in my arms, so heavy and small, like a golden bullet, a sweet smile mixed with milk on the tiny lips. And, and I knew I was a loser and I didn't mind. I was going to keep this baby. Shall we now listen to Zara, said Greg. You were saying. I uncrossed my legs, smiled, shifted in the chair, inhaled, and then, then I threw up the cafe puccini coffee 